My name is Jim Paley. Uh, I'm a software engineer at SUSE. work on a virtualization team. Welcome to SUSECon, everyone. Um, <clears throat> today we're going to be talking about uh, virtualization related tuning controls um, for tuning your virtualization environment. Uh, we're not going to talk about general system tuning controls like scheduler and block IO and or the block and network uh, subsystems. Um, but keep in mind that those tunables are applicable along with what we're going to be talking about here today and tuning your system. Oh, and uh, one other kind of warning about tuning, it's difficult and maybe even dangerous to recommend specific tuning settings. Tuning is situational, depends on workload, software components, hardware. So what tuning settings may work in one environment may actually degrade performance in another. <clears throat> in this talk, I'm going to be using a lot of libvirt domain XML snippets to describe some of these tuning configurations. Um, so hopefully everyone has seen that or at least a little bit familiar with it. And if not, just some basic familiarity with XML should suffice. Um, <clears throat> but a lot of stuff to cover here. And to kind of make it somewhat comprehensible, I've broken it into the four classic subsystems. Um, with a little bit of NUMA thrown in at the end for fun. And we'll start off, though, by some <clears throat> talking about some general uh, recommendations or suggestions that kind of don't fit into those other categories. Uh, the first one is <clears throat> the only software that should be installed on a virtual machine host is software that fulfills that purpose. Don't install unnecessary things like X in a desktop and these type of things. Um, they consume resources. If they're running, they consume CPU and memory resources. And all software has bugs, so unneeded software brings unneeded bugs. Uh, just don't install it. <clears throat> the second topic here is a little, we've kind of waffled on this. Um, but our current suggestions are to run NTP everywhere, run NTP in the host and guests. Um, <clears throat> both KVM and Zen have a pair virtual clock <clears throat> that can be exposed to the guests, but there's some problematic corner cases with those, things like save a VM, wait an hour or day or week, restore the VM, and all of a sudden time jumps forward by an hour or a day or a week. And NTP can cope with that a little bit better than the um, <clears throat> pair virtual clock. So yeah, our suggestion these days is to run NTP everywhere. And running virtual machines and the software to manage those requires resources. So make sure you have enough resources for your host. Don't resource starve it. And <clears throat> conversely, don't over-allocate resources to virtual machines, or the host for that matter. Um, and the host, I mean, in Zen, you can kind of control those things. KVM, not so much. But <clears throat> just don't over-allocate your resources. And remove any unneeded devices from your VM configuration. Oftentimes, we create VMs with tools uh, like uh, vert install and other such tools that use a template and maybe have a set of default devices. If you don't need those, remove the things. And last but not least, use pair of virtual devices. They perform much better than emulating hardware and software. <clears throat> I'll have a few comments on Zen. <clears throat> Zen is a microkernel that doesn't provide all the uh, services of a general purpose OS. Uh, for that purpose, we have SLEZ that runs in a VM in domain zero, it's called. <clears throat> this VM, uh, like any other VMs, should not have resources over allocated to it. <clears throat> so we recommend, uh, by default, out of the box, the domain zero will get most of the system memory and a share of all the virtual, or a share of all the system CPUs. Um, and we recommend setting that to some explicit number. We can't do it out of the box because it depends on workload. Um, it's really a hard thing to set 
out of the box. We don't know the size of machines and, you know, like I said, workload, workload running on there. So it's best to just <clears throat> give DOM zero an explicit amount of memory and an explicit amount of virtual CPUs. Zen store is an integral part of a Zen deployment. It's <clears throat> a service that maintains state and notifications of the system. <clears throat> the access pattern of the Zen store database is such that <clears throat> it performs better if it resides in memory. So we recommend running that in memory. This is the default in SLES 12. Um, Zen store database runs in tempfs. <clears throat> Uh, but in SLEVS 11, the SLEVS 11 users out there, um, just keep that in mind. You can bind mount the path of the Zen Store database to a RAM disk, and uh, you get much better performance of the Zen Store. And one thing that's really not a guideline, so to speak, but um, an interesting note is in SLEVS 12 SP2, we no longer have kernel Zen. Uh, PBOps kernels used everywhere where the kernel dash then used to be used. Okay, on to the first uh, of the four subsystems, network. These first couple items here pertain to um, a broader landscape, such as you know a cluster of hosts, virtual machine hosts, uh, accessing a cluster of storage. <clears throat> so modern machines have <clears throat> Uh, Multi-port network cards, make use of those by separating your admin, storage, migration networks on different networks. Um, it <clears throat> can avoid congestion on those networks. One thing about uh, doing that though is I just wanted to point out there's this uh, condition known as ARP flux. This is when a machine, could be a host or a virtual machine with multiple interfaces, responds to ARP requests on multiple of those interfaces. Um, if you want to know more about it, I provided a link here, but just wanted to bring it up, and it's something that you can uh, avoid by enabling the ARP filter <clears throat> within the network tunings. And one last thing here before we move on to specific network devices. Um, make sure you have the same MTU across all your devices. If you need a bigger MTU, the default's 1500. If you need a larger one, make sure you set that on all devices. Otherwise, as packets flow between devices with different MTUs, those have to be split, merged back together. It's really a drain on performance. <clears throat> So moving away from kind of the broader network landscape down to a host, um, we can talk about the virtual interfaces that are available to virtual machines. And <clears throat> the supported and preferred ones are the pair virtual interfaces. Uh, they're multi-queue enabled, like your better network cards. And <clears throat> for KVM, all these pair virtual devices have this front end, back end architecture. And in KVM, the front end, which lives in a virtual machine, is virtio.net. It's backed in the host by the vhostnet back end. There's quite a few tunables here, which we'll talk about in, in uh, some sub subsequent slides. For Zen, the front end device is Zen <coughs> Vif. In the old kernel, in the old Zen kernel, uh, the back-end device was netback, and the PVOps kernel is zen under net, underscore netback. Um, zen and KVM both support emulating some of your popular network cards, E1000, RTO, 8139, for example. Um, we don't recommend using these, though, right? The performance is quite bad, and again, you know, emulating physical network cards and software is pretty costly. If you want the <clears throat> throughput of a physical network card, the performance of a physical network card in your virtual machine, then by all means use one. Uh, there's several mechanisms to do that. Single root I.O. virtualization is uh, a hardware <clears throat> feature that allows you to create virtual interfaces in the hardware and expose those to a virtual machine. The Mac VTAP module is a nice, cool feature that 
It allows you to create virtual interfaces on top of your physical interface and expose those to your virtual machine. Uh, one downside of Mac VTAP is that there's no virtual machine to host communication. So if that's something you need, Mac VTAP's really not an option. Uh, you can also pass through an entire physical network card to a virtual machine, but we generally don't recommend this so much, and in some cases uh, not even supported due to uh, some security problems there. And one thing to note about hardware pass-through in general, not just for network devices, but anytime you do this, it kind of complicates migration. If you've given the VM a slice of the hardware and you want to migrate this thing to another host, that host has to have the same hardware, the same device, and the same bus, and the same slot, yada, 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 for this to work. So it really complicates things when you give the virtual machine hardware. And this graph, it's not terribly useful because I just ran this iPerf test on a one gig network, but it does, it is useful to show the uh, benefit of, particularly in VM to VM communication on the same host and VM to host communication of the pair virtual devices. Um, you know, it's easy, scales off here is a five gig, but even the E1000, it can easily saturate one gig, ne one gig network. But where these things really shine, the virtual devices is in VM to VM communication on the same host, like I said, and VM to host communication. <clears throat> the Mac VTAP, as I had mentioned earlier, there's no VM to host uh, path there, so we have a big goose egg for that one. But the VM to VM communication on the same host, Mac VTAP performs pretty well. It's not quite, uh, you know, has some overhead compared to the pair of virtual devices, but it does perform well. <clears throat> so I had mentioned that the Vert IO net device has quite a few tunables. <clears throat> I've listed some of these here. Um, some interesting ones are the first one up here, the IO event FD that's off by default. <clears throat> This is, if you turn this on, essentially it enables another thread in KVM, QMU, Zen will use this. Zen doesn't actually support any of these settings. On the next slide, I'll, I'll show you what it does support. Um, but <clears throat> the IO event FD, if you have this on, it enables another thread in QMU to handle IO events. Uh, and this can reduce <clears throat> steal time and spin lock contention in the VM. So if your VM is experiencing high IO CPU utilization during IO, um, enabling the IO event FD can help you out. <clears throat> Another interesting one on that same line, the driver line is queues. As I mentioned, the pair of virtual devices support multiple queues. And <clears throat> this setting <clears throat> will create a transmit receive queue pair for each. Uh, well, ideally, what you want to set that to is to the number of vCPUs that your virtual machine has. You wouldn't want to set more, but it'll create a transmit receive queue for each vCPU running in the virtual machine, and so you can really increase throughput by uh, using multi-queue. VertIO.net also supports some of the classical uh, network configuration settings like checksumming and offloading, um, depending on your network I.O. traffic. These can be really helpful. Um, if it's a lot of VM to VM communication, extremely helpful. Uh, you offload all this checksumming and segmentation to the network card, and in reality, the network card never has to prepare a packet for the wire, so none of this stuff is done. Uh, and can really save performance on this type of pattern, like I said, with VM to VM. And we can also control some bandwidth uh, quality of service type parameters. Uh, your average peak, there's even some burst. If you look at the Libvirt documentation, you'll see all of these things there. But um, just keep in mind that what I wanted to point out here really was that you can also uh, control the quality of service of Vert IO net devices. The Zen network device, <clears throat> not as many uh, tunables exposed through the Zen tools, so there's not much we can do there. 
in libvirt. <clears throat> One thing that we can do is uh, average bandwidth, and really that's about it. But the kernel modules that back these things, netback and the pvops, and, or zen underscore netback and pvops, and netback and kernel dash zen, have some parameters to support things like, or to specify things like how many queues and so on. So some of the things that we could do with vert.io, we can do with Zen via module parameters. Uh, of course, these will exist or pertain to the system as a whole, not per VM. But the Zen net and front uh, devices kind of, <clears throat> in, when they initialize, they negotiate, you know, default settings which are pretty good in most cases. You really probably don't need to be tweaking on these things, but just wanted to make you aware of them. Um, on to disk subsystem. Um, <clears throat> disk have what I like to call double vision, the disk subsystems. Um, you have two page caches, potentially, one in the host, one in the guest, two I.O. schedulers. <clears throat> possibly two file systems, depending on if you're using block devices or image files, two volume managers, perhaps. And the remedy for this is to configure the guest or host to bypass one of these redundant layers. <clears throat> and we'll talk about that in some of the following slides. Um, but first thing I wanted to talk about was <clears throat> the types of block devices that are available to you, or top types of disk devices. There's block devices, <coughs> which <coughs> traditionally have performed better. Uh, there's been quite a bit of work in the upstream communities to improve the performance of image files. So they're really pretty close now. I'll show you in a couple slides. <coughs> nice thing about block devices is system and storage administrators are familiar with these things. There's lots of tools that have been created around them, even entire products. Um, so, you know, people are familiar with managing them. And block devices will eliminate one of these redundant file systems, right? You'll deal with the file system in the guest only and not in the host. Image files <coughs> are a fair bit easier to deal with. They're easy to copy around, easy to manipulate, easy. We've created whole tool sets like Live GuestFS to um, <clears throat> manage image files. There's another nice feature you get with image files is uh, thin provisioning. So, you know, a 100 gig virtual disk may only take up two gig of actual space on, on the uh, host file system. <clears throat> and along with image, along with block versus image files, we give you more choices in what format of image files you prefer to use. So certainly the most common, and from what I see most use is raw. Again, this has historically been the best performing image format. <clears throat> QCOW2, um, this is our default now. And if you create a virtual machine with vert install, by default, you're going to get a QCOW2 image. The <coughs> performance of that has increased quite a bit. A lot of upstream work in, in, in increasing QCOW2 and kind of getting it up to par with raw images. Um, and a couple of years ago, the QMU community created kind of a next generation cow format called QED. I haven't seen a lot of use of this yet, <clears throat> but we support it. And we also support VHD, VHDX, and VMDK, but for import and export only. Uh, so if you have a VMDK image and you want to use that on Zen or KVM, we recommend using QMUIMG to convert that to one of these other supported formats that are more performant. <clears throat> on this slide, I wanted to kind of show you the how um, the performance of the image files have really caught up with the performance of block devices these days. So, in this case, I'm running this FIO test on the host, directly using a block device on the host. 
Here I've passed that block device directly into the guest, and these other three are image files of the various formats. And as you can see, these image files really perform uh, nearly as well as the block devices these days, which yeah, aren't far off from the host. Uh, I think I have some caching effect here, even though I've tried to disable cache in most of these slides you'll see all around. Um, I think I have some caching effect here that I didn't disable. That's an awful big jump in the host and read performance compared to writing to that thing or reading from that device in a virtual machine. <clears throat> so cache modes, speaking of cache, we have several cache modes you can choose from. And which one of these you want to use kind of depends on your workload and perhaps even the type of OS that's running in a virtual machine. The first one is right back. <clears throat> Here the page cache is enabled for both reads and writes, and writes are reported completed as soon as the data hits the page cache. So if you are expecting data integrity, you, your OS better support right back uh, mode. And most OSs do these days, everything from Celeste 11, RHEL 6 on up, uh, support right back. <clears throat> and in these cases, if data integrity is important, the OS will send flush commands to flush that data to disk. Right through, <clears throat> the host page cache is enabled for reads and writes, but writes are only reported completed when the data hits the disk. And <clears throat> VMs are informed of no write back cache, so there's no need for them to have to send flush commands to maintain data integrity. Direct sync, <clears throat> um, page cache is disabled, writes uh, reported completed only when the data hits the disk, and this mode was kind of the last one added to QMU, um, and it's useful for the older guests running in virtual machines that don't support write back. Uh, so things like uh, SLES 10 and RHEL 5. <clears throat> the none cache mode, Disables all caching. It opens the file with odirect semantics. Opens the file or a block device. And guest is informed of write back cache. So again, they're expected to send flush commands to maintain data integrity. And unsafe is, just as it sounds, all cache is enabled. Flush commands from the guests are just dropped on the floor. Uh, you get really good performance with this at the expense of data integrity. But there are use cases for this. For example, in installation, if you're installing an OS into a VM and you, know, you have a power problem or something goes bad and uh, you corrupt the installation, what do you do on a physical system? You have to restart the installation anyway. So uh, during installation, if you use tools like vert install during the first phase of installation, we actually set the mode to cache mode to unsafe. So the install rip through, and once the install is complete, then set the cache mode back to default, which is right back, by the way. Here I'm showing the effects of the cache modes on read in this chart. And as you can see, the write back, write through, and unsafe, we're using the host page cache, and we bypass that in the direct sync and none modes. So <clears throat> using cache can greatly affect the uh, performance. Here's write bandwidth. As I had mentioned, write throughs, we see that that's dropped off on writes because, again, the writes are only reported completed once the data actually hits the disk. So here we only have the write back and um, unsafe modes where we're seeing really good write bandwidth. Next couple of slides, I want to talk about some KVM specific disk tunables. Um, the first one is I.O. modes. <clears throat> There's two IMO modes supported by KVM. 
native uses Linux asynchronous I.O., uh, generally lower CPU overhead. The threads mode uses a pool of worker threads to emulate POSIX uh, asynchronous I.O. And with more threads in a heavily loaded system, often you'll start seeing some latencies. Threads is the default right now in SLES, um, primarily because it worked well with all types of devices. LVM, block devices, uh, image files of the various formats, <clears throat> really didn't depend on the underlying file system. Hosting image files in a host could be ButterFS, could be XFS, EXT3. Threads generally worked well uh, regardless of what was backing the, the disk device. <clears throat> it's the default mode in SLES, but these days, for most of my testing, native generally performs a little bit better. And we've talked about this internally and actually may propose upstream to change this default. Uh, and then we would inherit that you know, in subsequent updates and upstream code. At any rate, I've shown a little example here of how to set that I.O. mode. And like I said, the default's threads, but if you find that native performs better for you, then your VM, each VM and your configurations would have to have this uh, little snippet in there. And here's kind of a little graph of how the IMO mode affects the bandwidth of read and sequential and random read and write workloads. So this was to an SSD that was passed through as a block device to the VM. <clears throat> and certainly a, a nice improvement on, well, both sequential read and uh, right, not so much, but um, what I should have done here really is Im Im imposed over this um, CPU utilization. So as I said, native may work out better for you, particularly in like scale out scenarios where you have many VMs running on the host. In a threads model, you could start seeing some latencies due to you know, contention of all these threads needing CPU time to process the I.O., whereas native, um, kind of a callback type architecture. And so <clears throat> those type of scenarios of scale out, native we found to be a little bit better. And a scale up where you have some large VMs, many or just a few large VMs on your host that perhaps have several disks, then threads is maybe your better choice. Again, hard to give you a you know, very specific recommendation here because it all depends on workload and usage patterns. Another cool feature of <clears throat> disk devices and KVM is ability to have threads that service your I.O. Um, generally, you'd only want one thread per disk and you <clears throat> specify this stuff in domain configuration by saying how many I.O. threads you want. So in case you, know, you had two disks, you would set that to two. And then in your disk configuration, you can assign an I.O. thread that will process I.O. for that disk. And they start off at, uh, with an ID numbering of one up. <clears throat> Again, this is something that you know, you wouldn't want to have more I.O. threads than disks. This was one that was kind of tough to test easily. I mean, hindsight, I probably should have, um, you know, had, yeah. It's, it's one of those benchmarks where I struggled to come up with a good way to show how this affects the system. But at any rate, in this case, again, I just had a single SSD assigned to my VM and uh, assigned that disk, that SSD, an I.O. thread, and read performance is certainly much better. Write, not so much. Um, maybe a more interesting one here would have been to have several disks, no I.O. threads, several disks, each with an I.O. thread, and you know, combined throughput. 
<coughs> the I.O. scheduler, uh, as I mentioned back when we first started talking about disk, <coughs> we have this double vision with I.O. schedulers. You have an I.O. scheduler in the VM, one in the host. Generally, the scheduler that's best positioned to submit I.O. to a disk in the most performant way is the one that's closest to the disk, so the host. Uh, it knows the physical characteristics of the disk. It knows how I.O. is coming in and out of this disk, so it's best able to um, accommodate scheduling of that. In fact, in kernel 3.13 and above, virtual disks have no I.O. scheduler. Um, and so SLES 12 SP2 and above, if you were to look at the, the path where you can set and view the scheduler as this SysFS interface, if you were to look at that in a virtual disk, in a virtual machine, it'll be set to none with no option to change it. In kernel 3, or less than 3.13, so SLES 11 SP1 and older, uh, CFQ is your default scheduler for all disks, including virtual disks. Um, and if you look at a virtual disk and SLES 11 or SLES 12 SP1, for example, you would see CFQ, deadline, and no op as your options. Um, <clears throat> we recommend changing the scheduler no op in the VMs. Again, in SLES 12 SP2 and above, this will be default. Um, <clears throat> and then in the host, depends on workload. So in this chart, I have the scheduler disabled, or none, in the VM, and these settings in the host. And this is uh, an FIO test that's working on a really large data set. <clears throat> and deadline and no-op perform quite well here. This is just one VM. <clears throat> This is the same except a small working set, and again, deadline and NOAA. Most of what I've seen deadline generally performs a little bit better. <clears throat> In this case, I've had five virtual machines running on kind of a small host that I had, uh, all of them accessing image files on the same disk in the host. And here we start seeing the uh, CFQ scheduler performing a little bit better, particularly on writes, than the deadline and no op. So again, the moral of the story here is these type of settings depend on your workload. Um, but CFQ is the default, and generally is probably going to work best for you. <clears throat> you know, these previous slides where I had one virtual machine running on a host, not so realistic. Um, but it's just another one of those tunables that you really need to experiment with and figure out which what works best for you depending on your workload. Okay, on to some <clears throat> CPU topics. The first one is probably quite obvious. Um, avoid over contention of CPUs, <clears throat> host CPUs. And here, I, I don't mean you know, on a smartly used system, you're certainly going to have contention for CPUs. Processes are going to be waiting for CPU time. What I mean here is over contention due to misconfiguration. So either you're running too many virtual machines on this host, or you have some pinning that's incorrect. For example, you have a set of vCPUs all pinned to a set of physical CPUs, or several vCPUs pinned to a specific physical CPU. So we want to avoid those type of misconfigurations. The, C the process scheduler itself has many tunables. Um, a whole session could be devoted to discussing all the process scheduler tunables. <clears throat> but kind of, you know, the, your, your options for tuning when it comes to process scheduling is performance versus latency. You have to pick one or the other. You can't have the best of both. Um, really, about the best advice I could give you on 
processor scheduler tuning uh, knobs is to refer to the SLEDS tuning guide. Uh, there's a whole section in there on process scheduler and various things you can tune there. Uh, but another thing to consider on the host is your CPU power states. Um, <clears throat> generally, your options here are power saving versus performance and latency. If performance and latency are important to your workload, then best to set the CPU frequency governor to performance and any of the max C state settings in the kernel, um, set those to state one so we have no power saving. Um, <clears throat> setting the governor to performance will prevent CPUs from going into deep sleep states and you avoid stalls when you come out of those sleep states. So disabling all your power saving features is uh, a nice way to improve performance and decrease latency. <clears throat> From a virtual machine perspective, <clears throat> there's uh, quite a few things to consider when it comes to uh, virtual CPUs. And the first one would be the models and features that you want to present to your virtual machine. So, you know, if performance is really important and all the latest fancy CPU features you have in your host, you want those exposed to the guest, then pass all those features through. There's what we call host CPU model and essentially passes the host CPU through to the guest. Um, <clears throat> that's fine if you plan to do no migration. If you want your virtual machines to be migratable, passing through the host CPU, unless every machine in your environment has that exact host CPU, is probably not going to work so well for you. Uh, in these cases, when you want to have your virtual machines migratable, it's best to present a normalized CPU model and set of features uh, to the virtual machines. And Libvirt has some really nice tools actually to help you out with this. They've kind of give some example here where Virus, Virus capabilities <clears throat> lists all the capabilities of the host. And included in there is the CPU model and all of its features. You can pipe that output of that directly into CPU baseline. The, that uh, subcommand of Versh will extract the CPU model and features out of the capabilities and the output of that could be appended to a file where you collect all of the CPU model and features of all of your hosts. And then once you have all that information, all the model and CPU features of your host, you can then, of all the hosts in your network, you can then give that file to CPU baseline and it'll compute a CPU model and set of features that will work across all of these hosts. <clears throat> so a nice little set of tools that, um, you know, when you have a big environment with homogeneous hosts, it's a nice set of tools, or heterogeneous hosts, sorry, it's a nice set of tools to create a CPU model that will allow your VMs to be migrated amongst any of those. Topology is another thing to consider when defining virtual CPUs. <clears throat> For smaller VMs, ones that will fit on a NUMA node, generally, and by default, uh, the topology configuration is how many ever vCPUs you've specified, you will get that many sockets of one core and one thread. <clears throat> For larger virtual machines that span NUMA nodes, <clears throat> your better performance is achieved by <clears throat> a topology that more closely resembles the host. Um, so, you know, if you have a four socket system with, you know, eight cores and two threads, you can experiment with similar topologies for your virtual machine. And like I said, for larger ones, generally, this has some performance uh, impact. If you really need to squeeze some performance out of your vCPUs, you can pin those to virtual CPUs or sets of them. Um, I kind of like the sets approach. It's not as explicit. It's 
uh, allows the scheduler a little more freedom in how to, you know, oftentimes it can be smarter than you can about how to schedule things. So um, that's what I'm showing in this example. Here I've pinned vCPU 0 to a set of vCPU 0 through 15. So it could run on any one of those. Um, if you really like to get explicit, then you can do a one to one mapping as I've shown down here in the, in the lower snippet. <clears throat> Last topic as far as tunables on CPU is um, controlling your scheduler a little bit from the virtualization tools. Um, shares is a unitless setting. It depends on relative settings of other virtual machines. So for example, a, a virtual machine with vCPU share set to 2048 would get twice as much CPU time as one set to 1024. Period and quota work together. <clears throat> uh, in the specified period, the CPU can only run quota amount of seconds. Those two can be used together to um, have your, all your virtual CPUs run at a constant frequency, for example. On to uh, some memory topics. <clears throat> Generally, we don't recommend memory overcommit. <laughs> but in KVM, um, we don't have this in Zen, by the way, but in KVM, there's a technology called kernel same page merging, KSM. This does allow you to overcommit memory. What the KSM does is <clears throat> there's a kernel thread called KSMD that scans memory pages and looks for identical content. If it finds them and merges the pages into one copy or one write protected page and frees up that memory for other virtual machines. It's off by default. <clears throat> you can turn it on by echoing uh, one into the SysFS interface. The KSMD thread has a few settings to control how aggressively it will scan memory. And if you set this too aggressive, it really starts consuming lots of CPU on your host. The default settings seem pretty good. They consume, I've found, between 5 and 10% of a core. Uh, but you can certainly adjust these two. Pages to scan would be how many pages the thread will scan before going to sleep and sleep is how long it'll sleep before waking back up and, and continuing to scan. So if you set this page as a scan to a high value and then sleep milliseconds to low, the KSMD thread will really start eating up some CPU. But you'll quickly merge all um, identical pages. And <clears throat> by default, KSM will merge pages across NUMA nodes as well, but it is NUMA aware. So you can <clears throat> echo zero into this another control interface on the KSMD and prevent it from doing that, which is probably a good idea, especially if you don't have any pinning of your virtual machine. So you haven't you know, pinned vCPUs and pinned memory to any specific NUMA node. Um, and they can float across there, it'd be best to disable merging them across nodes. Actually, I have that backwards. If you're pinning, you would definitely want this um, disabled. In this chart, I've shown a little test I cooked up where I had 25 VMs running on a host um, and then started the KSMD thread. It only took two scans to merge all of those pages. And as you can see from anonymous memory here, I mean, it really about cut that in half. The pages sharing and pages, pages shared as a number, it's kind of <laughs> looks flat there, mainly because they have such a, there was so much memory on this machine. But um, 
that's how many pages are being shared, and as page is sharing, it's how many sites are sharing that. So we're essentially what you save. And the higher this ratio, the better you're sharing. Um, if you were to test KSM on your system and you know this ratio is very low, it's probably not worth enabling. You're just uh, wasting CPU cycles with the KSMD thread trying to find pages to merge that it will never find. Page size is another thing that can really affect uh, the performance, memory performance of your virtual machine. So by default, um, page size in Linux is 4K, but it also supports two megabyte and one gigabyte huge pages. <coughs> There's a couple ways that you can deal with page sizes and huge pages in, in SLES. One of those is transparent huge pages, and as the name implies, it's transparent to processes and workloads running on the system. They don't have to be huge page aware to make use of transparent huge pages. Uh, when a process or workload, a VM for example, needs to allocate memory, if huge pages are available, if there's two meg pages are available, transparent huge pages will use those. If we can't allocate a huge page, it'll fall back to 4K pages. <clears throat> one thing about hu using huge pages, if your workload is one that's a characteristics of um, sparse access, then often this can really degrade performance. So if your workload has such a memory write characteristic, then it's best to disable this thing. Actually, the MongoDB documentation recommends disabling this. So uh, you know, perhaps a lot of database type workloads have such a sparse memory access that you, know, you get TLB misses anyway, and the extra overhead of dealing with that and with a huge page just doesn't make it worth it. So if you really want to manage this stuff yourself, you have some specialized workload that is huge page aware, then disable huge pages and take care of all the bookkeeping on your own. Um, <clears throat> best to allocate huge pages at boot time. You can do that with uh, the huge page size. So you can select one or two meg or one gig and then the number of them. Um, if you allocate a boot time, generally you're going to get them. Memory hasn't been fragmented, and so you, you know you can easily have your pages allocated. A runtime, uh, maybe you won't have so much success depending on how much uh, or how many huge pages you want to allocate. If there's memory fragmentation and they can't be allocated, then uh, you're stuck. But generally, you know, if you're going down this path, probably allocate them at boot time. And then in your virtual machine configuration, you're going to have to specify, OK, I want this thing to use huge pages. There's actually some other uh, settings that are available here, like page size. You can use two and two meg and one gig pages within the same VM. Uh, and there's some extra <clears throat> attributes on the huge page element there that allow you to specify that. You can look at the libvirt documentation has uh, plenty of details on huge page usage within virtual machines. <clears throat> a couple items that are more on the virtual machine side with respect to memory. Uh, so if you don't want swapping of your virtual machine memory to disk and the host, you can set this locked attribute or locked element in a memory backing config. And if you are using KSM, but you have a virtual machine or workload that you do not want merged, then you can set this no page, no shared pages uh, setting in the memory configuration. There's certainly use cases for that. I mean, I could see, you know, you have a VM that is more security sensitive than others. Uh, you wouldn't want those pages to be merged. Okay, the last topic I want to talk about is NUMA. NUMA is always fun stuff. Um, potentially huge impact on performance. <clears throat> For example, <clears throat> if you have a 
virtual machine and a vCPU running on <laughs> node zero, physical NUMA node zero, for example, and it's accessing some data that's local to that node. Next time that CPU runs, it gets migrated over to a different NUMA node. Yet the memory that it was working on is still on the previous NUMA node. Now all of a sudden that vCPU has to incur the cost of remote memory access to get it its working set. <clears throat> so it's these type of things that NUMA can really have an effect on VM performance. <clears throat> so some techniques that you can use to prevent that is of course the pinning, which we had mentioned earlier. You can pin vCPUs to physical CPUs on a, a particular NUMA node or a set of them as I prefer. You can also pin memory using a NUMA tune element so you can say which NUMA node I want this memory to come from. Um, <clears throat> and one note about NUMA is in SLES 12, we have an auto balancer that ba tries to balance, um, tries to place CPUs closest to the memory that they're accessing. So as the system's um, you know, working along, the balancer does all this bookkeeping and says, aha, you know, I want to get this CPU on this node so that it can, where its memory resides. And um, this auto balancer, again, would be something that's running in the VM and in the host. Anytime you start doing this type of pinning on the host side, you've balanced. You are explic explicitly doing the balancing. So you don't want the NUMA auto balancer on the host getting in your way. And you can disable it by uh, echoing zero into that proc if that's path. <clears throat> As I mentioned back in the CPU slides, uh, generally smaller V VMs which will fit on one NUMA node, you don't need to go through the hassle of pinning and all this stuff. The system's pretty smart about it. Uh, it'll confine vCPUs to a NUMA node or confine all the memory to, uh, to be allocated from that node and things work fairly well. Uh, if the system gets really busy and you know, maybe the scheduler makes some wrong choices at times and that's when you know, maybe you want to go to more explicit pinning uh, configuration. Another thing you can do though is expose a virtual NUMA topology to the virtual machines. And <clears throat> this really gives you quite some performance improvement when your VMs start getting large. Large meaning bigger than any one NUMA node. In this example I've created a, a virtual NUMA topology. There's two nodes. 16 CPUs each node and 16 gig of memory each node. And again, you can specify in a CPU configuration where those virtual CPUs uh, will run, which physical CPUs and in which NUMA nodes and where memory would be allocated. The last few slides, I have some um, results of some of the NUMA experimentation I've been doing. So in this case, this is uh, a VM that fits on a one NUMA node on my test system. It was a 16 gig, 16 vCPU, 16 gig um, VM. And this basic configuration is no tuning whatsoever. I just said, I want 16 vCPUs, I want 16 gig of memory, go at it. This one, I've pinned the CPUs to a NUMA node. Um, and using the syntax of a CPU set. So, you know, use CPU 0 through uh, 36, which were all on a single NUMA node. And then the last column there is a virtual to NUMA topology that I've exposed to the virtual machine. And as you can see, when everything fits on one NUMA node, uh, you get a little bit more by these uh, smarter configurations, but maybe not enough to really make it worth your while, right? Anytime you start having all this pinning going on, it's, <clears throat> it, it's some bookkeeping work that you have to keep track of and, and you know, know how big your host is. 
how many CPUs per NUMA node. Uh, it, it just becomes a lot of work. And maybe that's important to you for this little bit of performance gain, maybe not. When you <coughs> get to a larger VM, so span NUMA nodes, these things can really have some impact, right? In this case, I have a 72 vCPU guest with 64 gigabytes of memory. And again here, no pinning, no virtual NUMA, no anything, just throw the thing out there, let it run. And here I've carved up this VM with a virtual NUMA topology that kind of maps on top of the physical one. And particularly for read bandwidth here, I mean, you know, nearly twice. Um, <clears throat> so in these cases where you have these really large VMs that span NUMA nodes, it does make sense and could be well worth your time to cook up a little more sophisticated configuration than just allowing the system to do it all for you. And these last few slides, I wanted to kind of show the performance of a NUMA test on a physical machine and then on a virtual machine with the virtual NUMA topology. So, you know, how does virtual NUMA compare to physical NUMA? <clears throat> this machine was 144 CPUs. Um, I forget the amount of memory on this machine, maybe 128 gig. And the virtual machine, I presented a similar, similar topology to it. It had four virtual NUMA nodes, 36, vCPUs per node and had the system memory kind of carved amongst those um, physical NUMA nodes. <clears throat> and this test here is actually um, comes in a perf tool. It's perf bench NUMA. You could just uh, install perf on your machine and run this tool yourself. Um, <clears throat> and this one is showing local versus remote access. So this test will <clears throat> run on a CPU and access memory local, on a local node, and also run, also access memory on a remote NUMA node. And <clears throat> as you can see, the virtual NUMA case is pretty comparable to, to the physical side. There's been a lot of work in upstream QMU slash KVM over the recent years to one, even pr provide this virtual NUMA feature and two, really improve it. It's, it's come a long way. Here I'm kind of a same comparison, physical NUMA versus virtual NUMA, but um, memory bandwidth under different types of workload scenarios. So this N by M notation on the right is process by threads. So in the first case, the blue bar here is eight processes, one thread. Uh, second one, one process, eight threads, and so on. Um, <clears throat> these things can, the processes in this case are all isolated, working on isolated um, data, where the threads are working on common data. So, <clears throat> Next chart, actually, I'll show some convergent stuff that, that is quite interesting with respect to these, uh, you know, process versus threads. But again, the point here is that our virtual NUMA performs nearly as well, or at least not significantly different than a physical NUMA system. So I think this is my last slide, which is good because I'm out of time. Um, this is showing convergence latency. Convergence is... <coughs> This, when the system gets the, um, pin, the, the balancing of processes and threads with NUMA nodes where they're accessing memory into what's considered a perfect state. And uh, hard for me to explain that. I guess the scheduler and the balancer have got to a point where processes and threads are running on a node that also contains the memory they're working on. <clears throat> and in these cases, 
processes with isolated, which are isolated from each other and working on some set of data, you'd expect those to converge quite quickly. Um, <clears throat> and we can see that here, how the uh, multiple process workloads converge pretty quickly. And pro workloads that have a thread or several threads working on a, on a data set, those threads can you know, be running on CPUs that cross Numinos, for example, and that's why it can take them a little bit longer to converge. Uh, the balancer has to <clears throat> you know, recognize that and then place all of those thread execution on the node that uh, contains the data that they're working on. But again, the virtual NUMA, I mean here lower is better, um, virtual NUMA can perform you know, nearly as well as on a physical host. So I guess the whole point of these last set of slides with physical NUMA versus virtual NUMA is don't be afraid to use virtual NUMA these days. I mean, it's, it's really come a long way. And in most cases, when you're running really large VMs on your host, it gives you quite a bang for your buck. So that was a lot of stuff. My mouth is quite dry. Uh, <laughs> Sorry. <clears throat> but if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer those. And also, I'm here all week in the technology lab. We have a virtualization booth. Feel free to stop by if you have some questions that maybe require some further discussion or uh, I wasn't very clear here, which very well could be the case. But yeah, feel free to stop by and see me in the technology lab if you have anything to talk about with respect to virtualization and NUMA and VNUMA and so on. Thank you. Thank you.